during uh, these uh, few weeks uh, has been relative to uh, victorious living. Now, there are some who cannot really say they have been living victoriously. And with these various lessons, if we will get into them, we will be taught how to live victoriously. Uh, today's lesson is related to what we call temptation. And we have one of the greatest promises in the world that God will not permit us to be tempted above that which we are able to stand or bear. And so we have a promise to stand on that it doesn't matter what happens, we're capable of taking it. How many believe that? <clears throat> Let us begin with James chapter 1 and verse 12, which says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now that word blessed there is related to joy, believe it or not. Joyful, joyful is the man. So he says, joyful is the man that endureth temptation. Uh, on the other end of it, you know, I, I'm sure you'd have some joy, maybe not so much in the middle. That endureth temptation. For when he is tried, you got to catch that word, that the thing is to, uh, to, to test, to see what kind of fabric you have, you know. All automobiles and the new models are tested out, you know. They're tried to see if they can stand up to the road. When the rubber touches the road, what's going to happen, you see? And, and so uh, our lives are the same. Uh, when the rubber touches the road, what kind of a person are we? Are we quitters or are we grumblers or are we growlers or, you know, what are we? Blessed is a man that endureth any kind of thing that's thrown at him. For when he is tested, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord, or which Jehovah, has promised, say promised, has promised to them that love him. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, that eloquent British theologian of a generation ago, publicly stated that when, that we admire a man who was firm in the faith, uh, you know, providing he lived 400 years ago. But the same man, or such a man, if he lives today, is a downright nuisance. We like historical greatness, but let's keep it in history. Don't meddle with us today. In many cases, the laurels are given to dead heroes <laughs> and big bats uh, to the living ones. And in many instances, we don't even know what one is until after he's dead. You may think our country or parts of our country or segments of our country say bad things about the president. You ought to go back and see what they said about men like Abraham Lincoln while he was alive. Uh, he wasn't great until he had a gunshot in him. And he suddenly, I don't want to call them what I think they are, began to call him great. And he rises up in greatness, dead greatness. God is not like that. Thank God for that. Can you say amen? It's very possible that the other Jewish boys or Hebrew boys that came from Israel into Babylon did not care to join Daniel and his three friends. There might have been dozens of them over there. And no doubt they thought them foolhardy. They said, man, give me a chance at that dinner table and see what I do with it. I'll clean it up. Give me a chance at that wine jug and I'll show them how to handle it. However, uh, Daniel was the overcomer. His dedication and his faithfulness to God made him a conqueror for God. And if you read his story, he wasn't very popular while he lived. Those that were around him, those that he associated with, were the very ones that had him put in the lion's den. They were the exact ones. Now, the first thing you have to realize is that your life will be tested. How many are still here? Okay. Your life will be tested. You see, in what way? Well, number one, by giving you an opportunity to make a choice. For example, in 1 Kings 3 and 5, it says, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, Ask what I shall give thee. 
Hey, we'd have a mess on our hands this morning if God asked every one of you what you wanted. Are you here? Ooh, what we'd have on our hands. And so many times we're tested by a choice. God, if he'd have said, if he'd have said, give me riches, God said, yeah, you can have them. But what he did get, he got that as a plus. Say plus. plus. That if we follow after God, he has said, all these other things will be added unto us. We get those extra. How many like God's extras? And so we're tested by an open choice. Ministers, I guess, lay men too. Ministers have so many open choices. And most of them fail at that point. That's where they're tested at. Number two, sometimes there are hindrances that are, that are put in your way. And, and uh, you want to do something, and the thing don't work. There are hindrances put in your way to see what's on the inside of you. In Galatians 5 and 7, the great apostle said, Hey, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who did hinder you? You did. You were advancing. You were growing. You were increasing. You were doing great. I want to know who hindered you. Who was it put a block out in front and stopped you? Who was it put up an obstruction, say, this far? And you stopped there at that point. There are also influences that can come from others. In Malachi 2 and 8, it says, Ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. He's talking to the leaders. You didn't keep in the right way, and you caused many others to stumble at the law. You didn't keep it, and you caused others not to keep it. He says, You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. And so, uh, uh, sometimes there's an unfaithful one, and that unfaithful one goes around with, a, with an evil spirit causing others not to be faithful unto God. Now, these are ways that we can be tested. And if you're going to, if I were to listen to all the preachers that have told me that preaching was bad, I'd have quit about 49 years ago. I didn't listen to one of them. I said it's mighty good and getting gooder all the time. Poor English and good living. Glory be to God. Yes, there, there will be tests that will come to a life of a Christian. You may call them temptations if you want to. A fourth one is a, a prolonged and delayed answer to a prayer can test you. Think of Sarah having to wait until she was over 90 years old to have that boy. And she had been looking for him since she's 20. That's a long time to wait, you know. The Bible says that she believed God to be faithful who had promised. And she just kept clinging and holding like a drowning man to a little piece of wood. Holding and clinging and one day it worked. Glory be to God. We used to sing a song. Hold to God's unchanging hand. <laughs> I'm going to hold on. All right, we're teaching victorious living and that there are temptations. Now, there are right ways to resist these temptations. Number one, in Daniel 1 and 8, it says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. And so the heart must be set against the thing. If you are what we call wishy-washy, sounds Chinese to me. But anyway, we do know what it means, don't we? If you're one way and one way and one way and another way, then you are not stable. If Daniel says, well, I don't know what I want to do, he'd have done it. I'm not sure which is right. Huh. Anytime you don't know what's right, you're going to do the wrong thing. But Daniel knew what was right, and he said, I purpose in my heart, I will not defile. Say defile. defile. You mean the best food in the world is to be defiled? Well, I'd like to tell you one thing. In those days, the whole shooting match was offered up to idols before they ate it. 
he'd have been worshiping the devil while he's eating it. And the old image stood right in the big dining room where they were eating. He said, I don't need to eat in this place, and I don't have to eat that rich food either. You still here? Okay. What are some of the methods? Purpose in the heart, number one. Number two, <laughs> don't listen to kooky people. My English is not getting on too well today, is it? But the point's getting across. Isn't that amazing? In Job 2 and 9, it says, Then said Job's wife unto him, Do you still retain your integrity? Ooh. Now, be honest. How many had somebody to tell them like that? Do you still go to church? Why, we certainly do. What do you think? Do you still retain your integrity? Listen. She said, Curse God and die. Imagine telling her own husband to go to hell. This wise man responded to that silly woman and said it, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? He missed it there. He found out in the way in the back of the book that it wasn't God at all. In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Did you hear that? With his lips. He wasn't talking wrong. Your talk can get you into trouble. He wasn't saying the wrong thing. Don't permit yourself to be negative. If you do, you'll lose out with God. And so, listening to the wrong counsel. I wouldn't do that if I were you. You got to get your directions from God and stick with them. All right. Number three, you can be victorious by refusing to have companionship with worldly people. In Proverbs 4 and 14, it says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. If your companionship is with bad people, you're going to get bad. If you like to be with the old cronies, you're going to get crony-eyed. That's a new word, by the way. <laughs> so if we wish to walk in glory, walk in joy, walk in victory, you're going to walk with the right people too. You're going to walk with God and God's people. Can you say amen? Then if you're going to be victorious in your Christian living, uh, you need to be prepared spiritually inside. Ephesians 6, 13, it says, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in any evil day. And having done all to stand, whoo, stand therefore. <laughs> oh, glory be to God. When you've done everything to stand, keep on standing. Old Ironsides himself. Now, we have those that would say, uh, uh, Brother Sumrall, why should we shun these trials and, and negative things? Why should we shun them? Because Christ commands us into a state of perfection. Maybe not ultimate perfection, but ultimate, but uh, perfection of love and, a, and, and of an attitude toward duty toward him. In Matthew 5 and 48, it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So he says, uh, if you're going to live a victorious life, don't move toward degradation. Move toward perfection. Be a better person today than you were yesterday. Be a better person next week than you are this week. Can you say amen? Then he said, in 1 Corinthians 10 and 27, I keep under my body, and I bring it into submission, subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. There are thousands of people that can tell you how to live right and don't do it themselves. You call them hypocrites, I guess. I don't know. Almost every sinner in town can give you a, a one-hour sermon on how to live right. And go right on cussing, swearing, committing adultery, drinking, on his way. Now he says here, 
If I don't keep my body and bring it under subjection, that when I have talked to others, that last line says, I myself should be a castaway. I have to say that to myself, you see. That after I've talked to you, I must not only talk to you, I must live it then. I must live it myself. If I say joy, I got to have it. I had a, at least two uh, ministers that called me uh, last few days saying, pray for me, please, on the telephone. Uh, they had large churches. And I said, yes, what for? I said, I am depressed. Well, how in the world are you going to bring depression off of other people if you got it? I am not depressed. Oh, I didn't say that few. I was letting the devil know it. He, he, he sometimes hard of hearing. You have to speak to him. Very positive. Are you here? Don't instruct others and be a castaway. So you have to shun temp temptation in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, it says, Now all these things happen unto them for examples. If you will see what's happened to others by their transgression, that'll keep you out of it. I, I feel sorry, you know, for young people that won't listen to someone that's been down the road for a long time because they think they know it all and, and then suddenly they slip and they say, hey, I didn't know as much as I thought I did. And, and between the age of 20 and 30, it's amazing how smart their parents get. Are you here? In other words, they just woke up to find out that experience does mean something. Can you say amen? Now, all these things happen unto them. That's all through the Old Testament. For examples, and they are written for our admonition. Mr. Howard Carter, that was my, my teacher, my mentor, many times says, don't you ever think of beginning there. He says, I've been there. You begin where I quit. You begin here. And then you go. And he would rebuke me sometimes. He had said, I've seen young men that had great privileges, never amounted to a thing. What are you going to do? I'm going to do my best. So you better do more than that. For years, he prodded me into believing God for God's best, you see. Prodded me as a father, as a spiritual father. When we see the shipwreck of, wreck of others, we don't have to make shipwreck. When we see the despondency of others, we don't have to get in that pool of despondency. We don't have to get there. When we see others all broken down, we don't have to go that road. There's a road of victory for every one of us. The devil is a liar. These things are written for our admonition. When you see the mistakes of Samson, you don't have to do it. Or when you see the mistake of Jacob, you don't have to do it. They're put in the Bible so you won't do it. That's what they're there for. How many are going to listen? Amen. Amen. In James 4 and 7, it shows you the strength that we have. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There are many of us that know the last part of the verse that don't even know the first part is even in the Bible. Because we've never read it, all we have done is... is, is uh, I reiterated it, you know. Somebody else said it, and we and we we parroted it. Yeah, resist the devil; he'll flee from you. you. Better look in the Bible and see what it says, because it may not work for you. It says first, submit yourselves to God. <laughs> Dedicate yourselves to God. Give yourself completely to God, and then after you have done that, then you have a right to tell the devil to leave. When you're submitted to God, you say leave. And he has to leave. If you're not submitted to God, he does not have to leave. If you're living in sin, you can't say, get away from me, devil. He's paying no attention to you at all. Just hugging you a little tighter. Some of you have already had enough hugs, too. All right. How do we become strong in the Lord and the power of his might? The temptation is, is not a hurtful thing to us. In 1 Corinthians 4, 
uh, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, it says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. We are uh, victors through our energy, a positive action, that if ye walk in the Spirit, you do not perform the lust of the flesh. It does not say if you sit in a rocking chair and rock along. It does not say if you sit and you're lazy boy, which makes lazy girls and lazy boys, and watch television shows that you shall receive a crown. I don't think the Bible says anything about that. Now, if we are going to be mighty men of God, we need to get into a spiritual athletic training series. And he says, Know ye not they which run, run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run. And a glory to God forever. Don't quit. That ye may obtain. Then he says in 1 Corinthians 9 and 25, that's the next verse. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. Now, now he must have been at the Olympic Games there in Greece. Uh, he preached in Athens. And he saw those young males, powerful and strong and, and determined. And as he would look at them, he'd say, any one of these athletes that striveth for the mastery is temperate. Temperate. He knows when to go to bed. Now, a lot of Americans don't have that much sense yet. How many still here? Learn when to go to bed. Any idiot can stay up all night. And the next day, hardly be able to tell the time of day. It's a good way to get fired. And that went over like a lead balloon, didn't it? <laughs> I started to tell you that when you go to these places along the street that say you can have, eat all you can, go on down to McDonald's and get your hamburger. You know, sometimes you eat too much. Anyway, he says, every man that striveth for the master is temperate. Now, we're seeking to be masters. Can you say Amen. God says, be temperate. In Hebrews 12 and 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing ye also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that's all those beautiful witnesses of God in the Bible, then lay us, let us lay aside every weight, every weight, everything that's heavy on you, get rid of it, and, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. <laughs> Glory be to God. Now, now that's, that's the system. That's, the, that's, the, what's make, that's what, those two verses is what makes winners. And if you will get into those, they will do it. Then we read in the, in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, uh, one more verse in that one you were reading, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25. This is 26. He says, I therefore so run, uh, not as uncertainly, so fight I, but not as one that just beateth the air, but I keep my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be the castaway. Discipline lives. Discipline lives, the devil just cannot, cannot hurt you. That's all. James 1 and 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. That was our golden text. And so you receive a crown for your victorious life. One verse back of that, if you've got your Bibles open to it, in James 5 and 11, excuse me, the next page. In James 5 and 11, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. We have heard of the patience of Job, We've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now, we want to count them happy which endure. We're going to be the endurance bunch. Can you say amen? In 1 Peter 1 and 7, it says, And the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold when we're tried, because the gold perishes. Though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let the trial of your faith, the trial of your faith is more precious than gold. Then Revelation 3 and 21, it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So when temptations come, kick them out of the way and march forward. Live for Jesus and love God. When we truly love God and remain true to God, we are promoted by God the Father to a higher grade in his kingdom.